New Hope Community Church. We're so glad that you've chosen to join us today. Here at New Hope, we have a vision to compellingly communicate the all absolute sufficiency of Jesus Christ who meets our every need. If you're a guest with us today, we would love to connect with you. In the seat in front of you, there's a card that says connect card. If you would fill that out, we would love to be praying for you. Uh, that lets us know that you are here. Also, we would love to get you some information about some of the amazing ministries that New Hope has to offer. Thanks for joining us today. Cigars, cigarettes, temperillos. Dude, Steve, wrong venue. Oh, my bad. Excuse me. Get your popcorn, get your cotton candy, get your fair tacos. Welcome one and all. If you're over 55, we want to see you this Tuesday at Carnival 55. Check your bulletin. There's uh, information in there, very important information on game times, uh, calendar of events, all those things. And don't forget that as many games as you participate in, you have an opportunity to win some fine prizes. Not to mention chances to dunk Pastor Tim and Pastor Mark in the dunk tank. We hope to see you at Carnival Tuesday. If you're a parent of a teenager, a pre-teenager, an almost out of teen teenager, we have an awesome thing for you. On June 23rd, we have the Next Level Parent Conference. It's a one-day training conference with special guest speakers um, where you get a chance to take your parenting to the next level. You'll leave this conference uh, equipped, refreshed, and excited to connect with your teenager on a whole nother level. Because let's be honest, parenting teens is hard. So I can't wait to see you there. June 23rd, registration opens at 8.30 that morning, and we go all day. Lunch is included for a low price of $20 per family. If you go to newhopechurch.net, uh, right on the very top of the webpage, you can register there. Can't wait to see you. Next Sunday is Father's Day. And that means the baby bottles for change are due back here at New Hope. You can either drop them in at the office or bring them back next Sunday. As youth pastor, one of my favorite times each year is summer camp. It's a chance for students to get away from the distractions of life and go meet with Jesus up on the mountain. This week we have 14 junior high students going up to Hume Lake Christian Camps to meet with Jesus. Would you join me in praying for them that the gospel is compellingly communicated to them um, and that their lives are changed forever? Also, if you could be praying for the staff and the leaders that are also going up to serve these students, that God just move and that it'd be a powerful week for all of them. Calling all young families, Jam Kids Water Night is on June 27th. There'll be a giant water slide, a big slip and slide, barbecue, other water games. It's great fun for the whole family. Come along and join us. So that's June 27th, starts at 5.30. We can't wait to see you there. It's summertime. That means that it's firework time. In the student ministries department, we're going to be selling fireworks this year out on the front lawn. From June 30th to July 4th, we'll be selling fireworks to help our high schoolers go to camp. We would love for you to come and get some fireworks from us. Say hi, maybe hang out a little bit, um, but we'll be out there. We'd love to be your place to purchase fireworks this year. If you're a newbie here at New Hope, that means if you've been coming to New Hope for about 12 months or less, then we'd like to invite you to an ice cream social at Pastor Tim's house. That's just an opportunity for us to get to know you better and for you to get to know us better and ask any questions that you have. It's on June 14th, the time is in the bulletin. So if you'd like to come, please RSVP to Tim at tim at newhopechurch.net. Thank you so much for coming today. We're so glad that you're here. If you have any prayer requests, we at New Hope would love to join you in prayer for that. So just on the back of those Connect cards, if you want to put your prayer request on that, we would love to pray for you. We as a New Hope staff pray for you, church, every week. And we would love to pray for you specifically if you need some extra prayer. We hope that today that Christ is sufficient for you.
coming around today, and there are three things on it, and two of them are brand new, all right? Uh, the top one is about a Bible study that's going to be starting on Tuesday night, two weeks from this coming Tuesday, all right? So that's the third Tuesday from now, two weeks from this Tuesday. It's a Bible study on marriage called Love and Respect. The Eggershines, a husband and wife team, a doctor and a, uh, a nurse with their master's degree, uh, they wrote this book probably 18 years ago. I think it's one of the best books ever written on marriage. And uh, the, um, uh, the Eitzens, are they in this service or they'll be in the next one? Uh, they're going to be leading, facilitating this particular Bible study. It's going to go during the summer. Mark, I don't remember how many weeks it is. I want to think it's eight weeks. That's all right. Don't you love my advanced preparation? It's 10 weeks. All right, 10 weeks. Uh, called Love and Respect. It's going to go on Tuesday nights from 6 to 8 p.m. And if you would like to attend that study during the summer, if you would just put your name and contact information, they'll have enough material ready for you three weeks from now. The second one on here was on here last week. If you signed last week, you don't need to do it again. It's for how many of you are going to come to Carnival 55 on Tuesday. Do you know how many signed up last week? 117 are coming to the Carnival Tuesday. All right? So that's pretty exciting. You're going to meet some people you have never met before at church, all right? And that's going to be exciting. It goes from 11.30 to 1.30. Uh, uh, there's directions, kind of a step-by-step -step process of what's happening. It's going to be a lot of fun. I know the temperature is rising over the next two days. Don't let that worry you. Uh, eating's going to be indoors. Some of the games are going to be indoors. Uh, and we've also rented two outdoor water coolers to cool the pavilion down. So it's not going to be a problem for anybody. Uh, come and enjoy some great food from fair tacos to hot dogs to cotton candy to ice cream. It's going to be great fun. Uh, you got to come play some games so that you can dunk Pastor Mark and I in the dunk tank uh, and also to get some of the prizes are there. So if you didn't sign up, please sign up today so we make sure we have enough food for you. Uh, Jimmy Pardini's been calling Shelly about every other day this week. He's so excited. He did a thing Saturday night for 2,000 people. We're going to have 117. And he said, Tim, I'm more excited about that than anything I've done in a while. So uh, we're excited about having him here. And then the last sign-up sheet, first time it's on here, Vacation Bible School is going to be uh, in the month of July. It's an evening time Bible study. Uh, the guy... Uh, who does the program at Heartland Christian Camp for our fourth, fifth, and sixth graders is going to be leading our VBS. The kids are going to love it. Uh, we still need volunteers to help with Vacation Bible School that week. Would you be willing to volunteer? Put your name, your contact information. There'll be a follow-up meeting, and somebody will reach out and let you know how you can be of help that week, all right? Uh, if you have last year's T-shirt, let them know that. If you don't have a t-shirt as a volunteer, indicate the information on there they're asking for so we can have one for you. So those are the sign-up seats which are going around. How many of you men were at yesterday's men's breakfast yesterday? Stand up. Just stand up real quick if you would. All right, men, it was a great turnout yesterday. Okay, quick question for you because I missed it. All right, not because I wanted to, all right, but uh, so how did you like Andre? All right, man, I heard good reports. Four or five people called, let me know that it was good. That's Juliet's husband, all right? So I'm making her feel proud of her man up here today. You guys can be seated. Uh, he, uh, he works for Fresno Police Department. He works very closely with uh, Chief Dyer, and he shared his story, his testimony, some of his experiences. And, man, I had some texts and phone calls saying what a great, great Saturday morning breakfast it was. So be sure you thank your husband for us today, all right, for uh, a job well done. Let me highlight just a couple of other things and some updates on prayer requests. Junior high kids are leaving today for junior high camp. I believe we have 15, 14 junior hires going to camp, all right? Thank you for helping them get there. Um, let me tell you how excited one parent was. She dropped her kid off yesterday to go to junior high camp, all right? <laughs> She told me that last night, all right? And, and I said, oh, wow, you were really ready. Yeah, kid, school got out Friday. I was ready for him to go. But um, she did pick him up before dark last night, all right, and uh, was bringing him back today. I thought that was so awesome. But anyway, they're going to have a great time, and let's pray that there's some real good business that takes place for them uh, up at camp. Next Sunday is Father's Day. 
So come join us as we honor all of our dads who are with us and uh, also bring back those baby bottles. There's something kind of funny to me about Father's Day and baby bottles being on the same day, all right? But anyway, bring those back for the Pregnancy Care Center and they will pick those up next week. Um, tonight, five o'clock, don't forget the time change for our Sunday evening service. You can join Pastor Mark and uh, his Sunday evening worship team over in the Bridge Building and uh, they're having dessert afterwards tonight, all right? Um, we had an abundance of desserts left over from yesterday afternoon's memorial service. And they're all, almost all of them are homemade, all right? So desserts tonight after the Sunday evening service. They would love to see you there. Uh, you got about 48 hours to RSVP to the newbies ice cream dessert at our house, all right? If you have not responded that, you've been coming for a year or less, uh, we'd love to have you come join us Thursday night from 6.45 to 8.30. Uh, come with your sweet tooth. We're gonna have some really good homemade ice cream that evening, and uh, we wanna see you there. Uh, please RSVP. You can either text me or RSVP to my email address, tim at newhopechurch.net. Now, for those of you who've already SVP'd, there's 40 of you, all right, who have RSVP'd already. We're excited about that, all right? Um, here's what we want. Well, here's what I want to do. Get your pen out. I'm going to give you our address. You can find it on the website, all right, if you know how to maneuver through there, but I'm going to give it to you right now, and we're going to try to send it out separately to everybody in the next few days, but it's 529 West Athens. 529 West Athens. And if my house gets toilet papered this next week, I'm coming after all of you guys. I'm just saying, all right? I'm coming after all of you. 529, remember, I'm a, I am a permit carry, I am a permit carry pastor. All right? Just remember that. Five, 529 West Athens, okay? Um, we are one block west of Peach Avenue. We are one block north of Alluvial, all right? So from here, you're two minutes away, all right? You are two minutes away. Uh, and we are looking forward to that so very, very much. Um, all right, let me move on to uh, some updates on prayer requests. One that I was just handed this morning. Uh, many of you have been around New Hope for a while. I remember Pam Gallat, uh, her and her husband were part of our church at the merger 26 years ago, and they moved up to Shaver Lake. Uh, her husband passed away last year. Uh, Pam has been diagnosed with ovarian cancer, and it has been diagnosed at stage four. So please be praying for Pam. I don't know any more details, but we'll find out and keep you posted on that. Please be praying for her. Um, we have a list of names of folks who... Uh, have volunteered to assist us as we care for not only folks in our church, but folks in the community. As most of you know, because you hear us talk a lot about them, as we do a lot of memorial services here, both not only for our own church family, but we don't like to say no to the community. Uh, for me, um, I could say no to a wedding. It's really hard for me to say no about a memorial service. People don't need to hear no at that moment in their life. They need to hear yes. And so we do our best to say yes. We, we will move just about anything that we possibly can in order to say yes. In order for us to do that and to do it well as a church, it does take uh, volunteers because we're often hosting receptions as well for them. And as you know, our reception facilities are somewhat limited, so it takes a lot of hands on deck to make it possible. We've got a great group of volunteers. We have been pushing their limits, I think. They haven't complained to me at all but I think we've been pushing their limits these last couple of weeks, and it's not slowing up for the next two weeks, okay? Um, and so, I just wanted to throw this out again. If, if, if uh, you've never volunteered for this area or you've never heard about volunteering for this area, I want to let you know we've got a way in which you can, can help the needs of others by volunteering on that day. There are three ways that people help. Set up, serving, and clean up. Uh, by dividing it that way, it doesn't require more than about an hour and a half to two hours time in each one of those time periods. So it's not too much on any one group of people. So uh, here's the way this works is out of the office, we send out an email to those, all those on the volunteer list. Here's what our needs are. Here's what the times are. All you have to do is check the box. It comes back in an email to us. Uh, if you get ready to check and you find out it's full, then you know you're not needed for that one, all right? And we'll call on you the next time. So the first ones to kind of check the box, fill them up. We know our volunteers are there. And uh, 
the more we have, the less times that other people have to serve time after time after time. So if that's something that you would be interested in doing and helping to meet needs, you get to meet other people in the church by working with them as a volunteer. You also get to love on people at a critical time in their life, and it makes a difference. So here's the way you can do this. Take one of those cards in the pew, the communication cards that we use for prayer requested visitors. Put your name on it, your contact information, and just write somewhere in big letters on there, helper. That's the code word for today. Helper, and that's going to tell our office staff, add them to that list. All right, thank you so very much for your willingness to do that. Now some uh, prayer request uh, updates. Rich Smith, our, our counseling pastor here at church, had an ablation done on his heart uh, last Monday. He's doing good, okay? They believe it was successful. He's not had any recurring experiences. The doctors think it went just perfect, and we're glad to hear that. Most of you know Bernie Krause was going to Stanford this past week. On Thursday, he was going to have this uh, procedure done on his esophagus because of esophageal cancer. Uh, they said this treatment, though it's kind of severe, it has great results and should not create any uh, ongoing processes for him down the road. So they went to have this done. They spent two nights in San Francisco and... He waited till 2 o'clock without eating all day long to be told, the specialist thinks there's another procedure that will be more effective, less evasive, and have greater results. But they need to talk to his doctor here before they can make those plans. So, the good news is there's a better plan. The bummer was it didn't happen this week, all right? And so uh, we'll keep you posted of when that is going to take place. Um, Ralph Emery service from our church, the retired highway patrolman. His service will be this coming Saturday at 10 o'clock. And then Joe Collins, also from our church, his service will be the following Saturday uh, at 11 o'clock. And we have some other names in the bulletin. I hope you'll read those of services that we've had this past week. So please be remembering to pray for each other as we go through all of this. Now, for something that's so much fun every single year, if you are a high school senior and you are in the service right now, would you stand up and come forward, please? Any high school senior that's in here, all right? Most of them come to the later service, but we are going to have, well, look at you guys, I'm so proud. Where are the women? Where are the girls? They're sleeping, all right, all right. Well, two on that side, two on this side, all right. Why don't each of you find your book on the table, all right? Your names are on a book, you all find your book, find, find your name, that's your book, then I'll talk about it. If your name's not on there, uh, Chris messed up. <laughs> you got to be on there. I saw yours. Do you see your name? No. John Castle. All right. Come down here. Look. Make sure. Uh -huh. Chris? He ran out on us. Okay. Here's the deal. Let's see here. Uh, okay. No, I can't do that. It's got his name inside it. Would you go get one? All right, hang on. We're going to get you one, all right? Um, the book that we get, I've been giving to high school seniors for 25 years. Some of you are going to say, can't you get more original than that? And the answer is no, I can't. Uh, there are a lot of others out there, and somebody will probably give you others. But here's what I'm going to tell you. I started reading this when I was 16 years old. All four of you are older than that now, aren't you? because I did not graduate at 16, and you all look much smarter than I do, uh, than I am, all right? So uh, I found this next to the Bible to be the most influential book I have ever read. It's one page at a time. It's one day at a time. You have five minutes that you can find somewhere in the adventure of your day, and I want to encourage you, particularly your freshman year, find five minutes to pull aside, read the one page in here, pray about it and say, God, use this in my life today somehow. You are going off to college. You are going to be challenged like you have never been challenged before to reject your faith. That's going to happen. I can almost guarantee it in a variety of ways. Uh, more people reject their faith during their college years and they come back at 35, 40, 45, and 50 and say, if I could go back and do one thing over again, the one thing I would do is I would put my spiritual roots deeper when I was in college because I have wasted a lot of years that would have made a difference in my life. And so that's why I keep giving this book. So this is, this is our gift to you 
and I hope that you'll put it to good use. When you get ready to walk away from here, I'm going to ask you to take a bookmark. Pick your color. They've got blue, yellow, green, or red, all right? So let's find out. Give us name and high school you went to and where you are headed this next fall. All right. I told you he was smarter than I am, all right? Bullard. You know where I graduated from? No. Hoover. Do you know what that means? We are mortal enemies. All right. All right. They, they, <laughs> that was always our comp, that was always our competition. All right. For everything was Bullard in those days. All right. Uh, all right. That's why you don't have a book. No, I don't know. It's Chris's fault why you don't have a book. So tell us what it is. And what are you going to study there? Most of you didn't hear that last part. That's a fancy way of saying what? Designing ships. All right. I like that. I like that. Okay. All right. And well, hold on just a minute. Who was your sister? Who is your sister? Yeah, that's right. Amanda's the one who plays for us sometimes on the piano when she's home from college, all right? And I just got ticked off this week because I heard she's not coming home from college this summer. Uh, she is currently in Tennessee. I think she's going to come Oh, okay, so I won't be ticked off very long then. <laughs> Where's she going? All right, back east. Oh. Okay, all right, all right. All right. Terrific. Good job, guys. Good job. Good. Job. Pick a bookmark. Pick up a bookmark. Yes, yes, yes. Come over here, guys. Get a bookmark. You're going to have a book to put it in. Here it comes, right here. All right. Here comes my Vanna. Here she. Here we go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good job, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry we messed up. Yes. If you'll hold that a moment, we're getting to him. <laughs> hold that just a moment, because uh, I need to make one of the notes before we get to that. We had a college graduate, all right, whose parents were in the last service. She could not be here today. That was Beth Young. She graduated from Fresno State, and uh, so we're so excited about that. Do we have any other college graduates in here? Any other college graduates? Still working on it, right? Okay, now, Tim, you may make your announcement. Okay, all right. Uh, we have, we have a, a young man, okay, a not-so-young man, who went back and did something very heroic. He went back and he finished his high school education. He had a little detour in his life. He ended up spending a little time at state expense. Most of you know his story, all right? He spent a little time uh, in prison. He then got a marriage certificate before he got a high school diploma. And uh, I am sure with able help from his bride, he finished his GED. And so we're going to acknowledge Mark Downs today. Mark, come forward. All right, my brother. Good yeah. job. Yeah. Good yeah. job. Good job. So for you, we got you something a little different. Okay. This is called Devotions from the Lake. And there's a mess. By the way, to all of you, I didn't say this. There's a little message inside your opening book cover, all right, for you from, from us here. And this is something now in your spare time, since you have your education completed, that you can sit back kick back and learn some more about your relationship with Jesus Christ. Experience his rest and his refreshment in the rest of your life. Thank you for saying it's never too late to go back and finish something. Thank We're you. proud of you, Mark. Good job, buddy. Good job.
In tribute, we have uh, 20, 21 graduating high school seniors this year. So during our offertory, they have prepared a video tribute, and you're going to get to see the name and face of all 21 uh, of those high school kids that are graduating from New Hope Community Church. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward, wait on us as we have our tithes and our offerings, and during our offering, please direct your attention towards the screen as we get a chance to see our kids graduating. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you so very much for your sufficiency in our lives, and I trust we take the opportunity as often as we can to express to family and friends and to others that, that Jesus Christ is sufficient for the challenges, for the everyday adventure of life and living. Father, when we are tired, you offer to us rest. You tell us to bring our weariness to you and find refreshment. Father, when we are weak, you let us know that you can be our source of strength. Father, when our life has been hit hard by circumstances and we find ourselves in despair, Jesus is our hope. Father, when tragedy has struck our world and maybe those that we love are absent from us now, they've gone to be with you. Father, you promise that you can turn and transform our sorrow into joy. So thank you for what you are able to do if we give you freedom to be active in our lives. Father, thank you for this step of success that so many in our church congregation are experiencing this week. They're graduating from high school and moving on to the next step, whether it is to college or whether it's to pursue a career or a trade. But the next step in life is coming. Father, thank you for for, for one who's graduated from, from college and is making the next step. Father, thank you for Mark who discovered it's never too late to go back and take a step forward when you've taken some steps backwards. Thank you for that encouragement that comes to us today. And Father, this past week there's been some others who've done another kind of graduation. They've graduated from earth to heaven. They've stepped from time to eternity. And Father, they've done so, though, with great hope, great anticipation to that which is better than that which they've left. Lord, you know the needs that others have walked into our sanctuary with today. Your knowledge of them and their situation is what gives us hope. And I pray there'll be a surrender of those needs to you today. For those facing challenges, those we've just mentioned in our service today, like Pam Gallant, we commit to you her needs. Thank you for the good news we've had from Bernie and that we're, we've, we, we, we've heard from Mary Ann Levendusky and her husband Jim and their recent surgeries. Lord, um, we pray for Irma and her granddaughters. Both of them head for Stanton tomorrow for updates and maybe some new direction in their treatment. Give wisdom to the doctors as they sit with them tomorrow. For what you want to speak into our hearts today, I hope we'll give you the freedom to do so. And then may we be responsive to that which you direct us. For the privilege of giving and sharing, we say thanks. In the incredible name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. What a special day. Proud of all of you graduates. Thank you for that step in your life that you've made. And you finished. You finished. The first of many things, all right, that you're going to finish, but a big one. And one of these days, you'll be able to say, I trust my hope for you, my prayer for each of you is that you'll be able to say with Paul, who wrote much of the New Testament, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. Now there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness in heaven. Finishing that one is the best finish of all. As you know, we're engaged in a sermon series here called What's Up With Heaven? In the first couple of weeks, we, uh, I ask you to give to me all of your questions. And I got probably over 100 questions that you hoped over the next several weeks we would begin to answer about heaven. And so we've been attempting to do that a few questions at a time, all right, as we look at the subject of heaven from the Bible. One of the things that uh, came up again and again and again in those questions was, Tim, what do you think about near-death experiences. Tim, is there validity to them? Tim, can we trust them? Is there, is there evidence that says that they're true? And so 
We are at that point in this series that we're going to begin to jump into that area. This week, next week, uh, maybe a third week on that. And certainly, just as this sermon series is not the all-inclusive sermon series that you will ever hear on the subject of heaven, neither is going to be this section on, on NDE. I will tell you, here's my challenge. As you know, the, our intent in this series has to disprove the idea that we are so heavenly minded that we are of no earthly good. Our goal in this series has been no, let's be so heavenly minded that our thoughts about heaven make a difference in the way in which we live on earth. Let's allow the prospects of where we're going to shape or reshape our attitudes, thoughts, and decision making as we live here on earth. And I will tell you where I am today and next week is, this is a tough subject, this whole idea of near-death experience. How do we take that subject and make it somewhat practical and give us some direction in our everyday living? So, we're trusting God for that, and we're hoping that, that good comes from all of this. Because i got to tell you, as we look at the subject of near-death experience, a lot of that is outside of our research in the Bible. To study near-death experience, we have to study outside of what we find here. That is contrary to the way most of us as pastors prepare a sermon. We start a sermon here, and we look at how it applies outside. And in this one, we are looking outside and then going to the Bible to see what our evaluation of that is from the outside looking in. And so that is our challenge. I will tell you at the outset today... That research for today's sermon is coming from primarily three or four places. Number one, it's coming from a book I recommended to you all at the outset of this series called Imagine Heaven by John Burke. Number two, a book called A Place Called Heaven, written by Dr. Robert Jeffries. Number three, maybe the most comprehensive work done from a biblical perspective on the subject of heaven is one written by Randy Alcorn. If you go to that book first, know that that's one that not only will you expand your mind, but you'll improve your muscles. It's a heavy book, all right? It's about that thick, all right? It's a, it's a pretty comprehensive look at the subject of heaven. And then, of course, the foundation for all the research is right here. If we can't connect back to here, we need to be very, very cautious. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 is the street address to a premise that we've been looking at ever since the first Sunday in the series. Because in order to go to heaven, what did that fifth grade boy say to a Sunday school teacher? You got to die first. That is a biblical truth. And the street address for that biblical truth is Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, which says, it's appointed for men. You understand that term men is men and women here, all right? It is, it is appointed to all humanity to die once. And after that comes the judgment. These words were the last words spoken by a very, very famous preacher. God is calling me. When Dwight L. Moody uttered those words, he was not talking about God's call on his life to preach the gospel. He was talking about his imminent death. Those were the very last words of that great 19th century American evangelist, Dwight L. Moody. The famed preacher had dedicated his life to preaching and teaching the gospel, just like Billy Graham did following him. Moody traveled the world sharing the good news of Christ's death and resurrection. And let me pause right here just to tell you, make sure you understand what the good news is. The good news is that Jesus Christ, God the Son, was born of a woman. He lived for 33 years on planet Earth. The quality of the life that he lived enabled him to die the death that he did. You need to understand that. He had to meet the qualifications of the perfect sacrifice, the lamb without blemish, in order to be the sacrifice that would atone, that would satisfy God the Father for the sins that we have committed against him. Jesus was born. He lived the kind of life that he did so it would qualify him for the death that he died. And then we don't end there. We go to the resurrection. 
It is in the resurrection that enables you and I to live the life today that God has offered to us that he calls abundant life. If it just ended at his death, it would not be the good news of the gospel because death is never a good place to end. It ends with life. And that is the gospel that Dwight L. Moody preached. It is the gospel that, that Billy Graham preached. And like Graham, Moody ministered to some of the most powerful men of his day. Presidents ask for his opinion. But on December the 22nd, 1899, at the end of a century, Moody died in his East Northfield, Massachusetts home. The fact that Moody died that is not noteworthy folks all of us will die just like Moody did but what makes Moody's death interesting is that he might have gained a glimpse of heaven before he actually died according to the story published in the New York Times yes the Times was printing nude papers already way back in 1899 Moody they recorded Moody's last statement and it went like this Moody said, I see earth receding. I see heaven opening. And God is calling me. Based on those who have had near-death experiences or NDEs as it's now called, those who study them said that Moody's description of seeing earth fading as if he were outside of his body, traveling through space, and heaven looming out before him is a classic near-death experience. I could tell you from a personal story that the last word my mother said on this earth was beautiful. On Friday evening, Sarah Mayhew, whose memorial service, graduation service, we just shared in yesterday morning, 91 years of age, Sarah went to be with Jesus and my mama. <laughs> and the last visitor my mother had on a Friday night before she died on a Saturday morning was Sarah Mayhew. She got her daughter to drive her down and she said there was just something that God said, I need to come right now. My mom had already kind of slipped into what we thought was her final sleep before she left for heaven. And when I went in and I got in my mother's ear and I said, Mama, can you hear me? Sarah's here to see you. My mother's eyes flew open and she sat straight up in bed. Sarah sat down in a chair next to her and Sarah came out about 35 or 40 minutes later and said, I thought you said your mama might not be able to talk. I said, for you, she did, Sarah. Mama went to sleep. We all went to dinner. We came back and checked on Mom. Non-responsive. Heinz Hospice home. Shelly and I were able to get a room across the street, the only hotel or motel anywhere close to Heinz Hospice, and our cousin said, let me stay the night, and we'll call you if anything changes drastically. Well, about five minutes to five we got the call and we were already getting dressed anyway and we rushed over there and as we walked through the door mom's final word was beautiful what does that mean Raymond Moody the father of the NDE craze as we know it today was the great nephew of Dwight L. Moody now, Raymond Moody believes that his uncle had a near-death experience, and this is a term that Raymond Moody coined in his 1975 bestseller, Life After Life. It was a best-selling book when I was working at Fresno Bible House. I had literally ordered hundreds of them over a period of about two years because we sold so many of them. From his popularity out of that book, Raymond Moody began to travel the country, literally the world, doing seminars on this subject called near-death experience the popularity of his book fostered a movement that still continues today it includes the international association of near-death studies you shorten that they're called IANDS I-A-N-D-S you can google that and do some study on your own there's also a research foundation that began in 1981 called the journal of near-death studies 
And there's a glut of consumer-driven books and movies on the theme of NDEs. But there is one important difference between the near-death experience that Raymond Moody describes and maybe what Shelley and I witnessed with my mother's comment and the experience that D.L. Moody had, and that's this. D.L. Moody never came back after death to tell people what he had seen in heaven. Is this thing a little hot? I'm getting an echo up here. If we can, I think it's coming from a monitor. Driving me nuts. With so much attention on the afterlife and so many stories in the media, what are you and I to make today in the 21st century of these near-death experiences? What does the Bible, oh, thank you, Milo. Woo. I don't know if you could feel it out there, but there's this echo and it was vibrating against my back. I'm just weird. What does the Bible say about NDEs and what can those who claim to have had a near-death experience tell us about heaven, if, if anything at all? I think before we can evaluate the validity of the NDEs, we must first understand what they are. And a good place to begin is with a definition. And the IANS organization defines the NDE experience as this. It is a profound psychological event that may occur to a person close, if not near death, or in a situation of physical or emotional crisis. So you can, can have a near-death experience and not be near death. You're simply going through a crisis because it includes transcendental and mystical elements. An NDE is a powerful event of our consciousness. And they are very quick to add it is not a mental illness. So if you've had one, you are not insane, all right? You're okay. In the ears, as those who have this experience call themselves, typically share a common experience that follows a very similar order of events. The people who have done the research over the decades and have looked at these testimonies, there is a pattern of kind of nine steps that seem to be followed. Let me just highlight those for you. I don't know if they're of great value, but it helps put it in a, a frame of reference for us. And you don't need to write these down. You can go to IANS and you'll find them. You can Google near-death experiences and they all of them list the same nine things. Number one, having the sensation of floating upward and viewing the scene from above your body. Number two, it's like traveling through a tunnel of dark space, seeing the light and you're heading towards it. Number three, spending time in this beautiful otherworldly realm. Number four, meeting God and Jesus or, or other angels. Encountering deceased loved ones or relatives and friends. Next is seeing the story of one's life sort of passing in review like they're watching a video movie. Next, having the sensation of overwhelming peace and love, though some have reported experiencing terrifying scenes of demons, distress, and hell. Next, approaching a barrier of some sort, signaling that they're not going to be allowed in yet, that they're being sent back to where they came from. And last of all, being called back reluctantly and agreeing to return to one's body and one's life. There is no question that such an experience can be transformative. When you are confronted with something like this, it prompts you to think about life from an entirely different perspective. Some have said it offers the possibility of an escape from something that holds us back and a transformation into something better. I don't know about you, but it sounds a little bit like what the Apostle Paul said in his writings when he said to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's better. If the NDE happened during a tragedy, it provides a way to make sense of that tragedy and to give folks the opportunity and the hope to rebuild their life. If our life has been a struggle with illness or doubt, an NDE often sets a person in a different direction. You nearly died, so something has happened that prompted a change. You may have never had a near-death experience, but chances are you've come close to death at some point in your life. Some illness or close call has brought you your mortality into sharper focus, and that brush with death can often be life-altering. I will never forget on the trail 
Uh, all of a sudden now the name is going to escape me in Montana. Uh, the Highline Trail. It's called Highline for a reason. It's really high. And from down below it looks like a line. The trail doesn't look very big. And actually in parts of that trail it is less than three feet wide. It is 3,000 feet straight down. And you're against a wall that goes about 500 feet straight up. Not a problem, because you're walking along, and what they have done is they've installed a, um, a metal line that you hold on to as you walk there. And that's all going good for about 240 of the 300 yards. And then over time, that line has come loose and fallen off. And your last 60 yards, there's nothing to hold on to. And you think, wow, my life could end right here. I've got a sneaking suspicion more people pray in the last 60 yards than they have ever prayed in their life. One of Dr. Jeffries, the writer of one of the books, one of the associates that worked with him told of an incident in his own life where he had a canoeing experience with his family and friends. Their canoe became wedged against a truck side's boulder in the middle of the river, and in a split second, water poured in the canoe, forced it sideways. Knowing the canoe was about to capsize, he grabbed a six-year-old daughter just before being thrown into the turbulent waters. He could do nothing to assist his 10-year-old son, who was in the same canoe with him, who despite wearing a life vest, the father saw his son go underwater. Finding his footing... This friend placed his daughter on top of a boulder and began to frantically search for his son. Fortunately, the boy had popped up yards down the river and was pulled into another canoe. That evening, back in camp, his friend couldn't sleep. He spent the night in tearful prayer, thanking God for saving his children's life. All of his regular routine concerns about work and debts and mortgage, the stuff of life, instantly disappeared. It was as near to death as that man had ever come, he said in his own words, and it radically changed his life. You see, coming face to face with this prospect of our own death, whether it's ours or somebody very close to us that we love, it can be very jolting and transformative in our life. Such an experience is a reminder of the brevity of life in connection to eternity, so it makes sense that those who have died and experienced the sensation of leaving their body and traveling out of this world to a place of peace and love, that their life would be altered upon their return from the grave. However, just because somebody has had a life-changing experience like an NDE doesn't mean that his or her experience is reality for everybody. But valid or not, no one denies that near-death experiences are becoming increasingly popular. Books about near-death experiences regularly appear at the top of the bestsellers list. They supposedly allow us to pull back the curtain and discover an answer to one of the great mysteries of all time, what awaits us on the other side of the grave. That is a question I frequently ask at memorial services. What do you believe is on the other side of death? Since all of us are going to keep that appointment someday, if we're going to keep the appointment, shouldn't we be prepared for it? So what do we think is on the other side? If you've been around very long, you've heard me say on many occasions, I can't make you believe anything, but you could choose to believe there's nothing, that this is all there is, that if that's the case, live like hell and don't worry about it. Or if there is something if the biblical directives of heaven and hell are true, then we need to investigate those claims because this is important to us and we should make appropriate decisions then. Is there really an existence beyond death? If so, is that existence the same for everyone? And could those who claim to have had an NDE tell us anything about the reality of heaven or hell? Don Piper wrote a book in 2004 that was very popular. It was called 90 Minutes in Heaven, A True Story of Death and Life. Any of you in here read that book? Yeah, it was very, very popular. Yeah, a dozen hands or so, and more went up. It was, it was a well-written book, and it created sort of a resurgence from 1975 uh, of, of interest in NDEs. His book was followed by a, a variety of other books. Bill Weiss wrote the terrifying account in 2006 called 23 Minutes in Hell, one man's story about what he saw, heard, and felt in the place of torment. 90 Minutes in Heaven, 23 Minutes in Hell. <laughs> two, two very interesting books there, all right? 
Um, since then, there's been an onslaught of other books. Nancy Botsford wrote A Day in Hell, Death to Life to Hope. Ebenezer Alexander wrote a book called Proof of Heaven, A Neurosurgeon's Journey into the Afterlife. Do, do, do some of you remember the old movie that came out, oh, what was it, in the 90s? Maybe 80s. Flatliners? Remember that movie? Yeah, there's a bunch of college students who, you know, kill themselves while the others are there to revive them so they can tell each other of their experiences. Nuts. Ma Ma Mary Neal wrote a book called The Heaven and Back, The True Story of a Doctor's Walk with God, and that was written in 2013. But none of these books have been as popular as Todd Burpo and Lynn Vincent's Heaven is for Real. A little boy's astounding story of his trip to heaven and back. This mega-selling book recounts the story of four-year-old Colton Burpo who died during emergency surgery. <clears throat> and he came back to life and he's told his family about his three-minute trip to heaven. We've gone from 90 minutes to 23 minutes to three minutes now. But a fascinating story. While in heaven, Colton claims to have seen his sister whom his mother miscarried and about whom his parents had told him nothing. He claims to have seen his great-grandfather who he had never met, and he talked to John the Baptist and Jesus. He saw God the Father, and God the Father had wings, and he saw the Holy Spirit who was kind of bluish in color and transparent. The book has sold over 10 million copies and spent over 200 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. But not every book about near-death experience has been as well-received, and at least one of those books we know was fabricated. The Boy Who Came Back from Heaven, a true story written by Kevin and Alex Malarkey. Isn't there something humorous about that? It was proved to be a fabrication, and their last name really was Malarkey. This book tells the story of Alex, who died and went to heaven after an automobile accident in 04. Alex suffered brain trauma, severe spinal and neck injuries, leaving him a quadriplegic. Capitalizing on the popularity of NDE books, a leading Christian publisher, Tyndale House, actually put the book out in 2010. However, five years after the book's release, Alex wrote an open letter recanting the contents of the book, confessing that he had lied, and he asked the Christian bookseller to pull the book from the shelves. Five days later, the publisher released a statement, we are saddened to learn that Alex Malarkey, co-author of The Boy Who Came Back from Heaven, is saying that he made up the story about dying and going to heaven. Given this information, we are pulling the book out of print. Alex wrote these words to Tyndale House. He said, please forgive the brevity of this letter. I must keep it short. I did not die. I did not go to heaven. I said I went to heaven because I thought it would get me attention and my father encouraged me. The popularity of these NDE books goes beyond our natural curiosity about the unknown. Implanted deep inside each of us is a longing of this place called heaven. While there is so much to love about earth, its people and its places, we instinctively know there must be something more, something better. King Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes 3.11 these words that God has set eternity in our hearts. Meaning there is this deep-seated desire and a natural inquisitiveness about what waits for us on the other side of death. But where are we to look for the answers about what really happens to us after we die? Listen carefully to the further confession of Alex Malarkey. He later wrote, When I made the claims I did in this book, The Boy Who Came Back from Heaven, I had never read the Bible. People have profited from my lies, and they continue to do so. My advice they should read the Bible. It is enough. The Bible is the only source of truth. Anything written by man cannot be infallible. It is only through repentance of your sin and belief in Jesus as the Son of God who died for our sins, even though he committed none of his own, that we can be forgiven and we can learn of heaven. I want the whole world to know. Listen to this. I want the whole world to know the Bible is sufficient. To all of you high school seniors, I want to encourage you, learn today, not 20 years from now, the Bible is sufficient. With all of the great wealth of information and studies we have in our culture, don't lose sight of the fact, the Bible is sufficient. God has provided us with a wealth of information about the future that awaits Christians and non-Christians after death. 
And although God hasn't told us everything we may want to know, he has revealed everything we need to know. As malarkey confesses, the Bible is sufficient. Some of you may not know, Steve is in here and he can kind of verify this. And maybe someday I'll get him up here and we'll interview him about this. Uh, Steve, have you ever been on a hospital bed and said that you died? Okay, how many times? Okay, once, if not twice, Steve Brown died and was resuscitated. When we were talking about that a week or so ago, he said, Tim, I'm really concerned. He said, because I saw nothing and heard nothing while I was gone. He said, I'm not sure where that means where I'm going, all right? But I saw nothing, I heard nothing, okay? Uh, Fred left the, the last service, and he said, Tim, I got to tell you, I had several of those experiences. Every single time I'd been using LSD, but, <laughs> but, but he said, I've had those. Let me wrap this up. The Bible is sufficient because the Bible is God's word and it's true. When it comes to evaluating NDEs, we must test all claims against the teaching of the scripture. To do so will enable us to fulfill the command of John in his first letter that he wrote in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God or not. And this puts us in the category as wise Bereans who are described in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, as those who examined the scriptures carefully to see if Paul's preaching was true or not. Can you imagine that about Paul? And Paul commended them. He said, wise people test what's being preached to them by the scriptures. We must always remember Truth trumps experience. I'm not talking about the president at the moment. Truth trumps experience. You see, it's easier to just go with experience and feelings than it is to study and know the truth. But truth is dependable. Truth does not change. Experience is fleeting and it's fickle and it's often easy to misunderstand. So we must discover what does God's Word have to say, if anything, about all these experiences. Next week, we will look at seven things that help us evaluate these in the past and any that we may come across in the future. And so we'll look at seven ways in which we test not only NDEs, but seven steps that we can use to process anything that comes to our life that may prompt us to make choices and decisions about our life. And we'll see how that parallels with the foundation of truth that we find in the Scripture. So I hope your takeaway from today's sermon is that truth trumps experience. We must be students. Paul said, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show yourself approved unto God. Not feel, not experience. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed. You see, when we make decisions on feeling and experience, as things change, we end up like author malarkey. And we end up ashamed. But you are one who rightly divides and applies the truth of God to your life. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your presence in our lives. Thank you for the revelation of your truth that you've given to us. It's not always what we want, but it is what we need. And help us to learn that we can depend upon it for everything that we face in life, in death, and eternity. Thank you, Father, that your Son is truth. In him we find our life. In him we find our joy. In him we find eternity. We trust you with our lives. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you. Have a great afternoon. Don't forget, service 5 o'clock tonight.